Hey, my name's Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, hey, today's the 5th of July, which means yesterday was the 4th of July. So happy birthday, America. Can we just give that up right there? Love America. America's awesome because you have the freedom to put like extra bacon on your cheeseburger. I mean, it's just an amazing place in America. Lots of freedom, lots of opportunities. Um, yesterday, my wife and family celebrated uh, July 4th by going to a parade in Waverly, which is where Pastor Gavin is from. And so I got to see the trailer he grew up in. And um, I'm joking. I got to go back to his hometown. The parade was awesome. And um, just so you know, I don't go to parades like just with a sack so I can pick up candy or like a little water bottle so I don't get dehydrated. I go to parades with my selfie stick because you just never know when the opportune time would happen to just just pull that selfie stick out and just kind of handle it. So um, I was walking around with my selfie stick, and if you don't know what a selfie stick is, it's just like this little pole you put your cell phone on and you can just take photos of yourself. It's unbelievable. I love America, the things that we make, the things that we inspire, the things that we champion, just unbelievable. And, um, and so I'm, I'm walking around, and I'm sitting next to this lady, and she's got a couple of kids. She said, how old are you? And I said, um, well, I'm 32. Why do you ask? Because she said, I, I just have never seen anybody over 16 with a selfie stick. And I said, well... <laughs> It's because you never met me. Like, my name, you know, you never met me. And then she's like, a little bit later, she wanted to get in on the fun. She kind of was like feeling left out with it. I, I let her borrow it. I just said, you can use it if you want sometime. So anyways, I did bring the selfie stick in the back just in case you need that. I say all that to say I hope you had a great time on the 4th with your friends and family. And uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles, let's jump in there. And uh, I kind of want to just lay out the main question in Acts chapter 15. We're going to be in verses 1 through 12 primarily. The main, uh, the main question uh, that the early church in Acts is facing is, um, what do we have to do to become Christians? Uh, what is the gospel? What is the good news of Jesus Christ? What do we have to do to inherit eternal life? Those are the questions that this early church is dealing with. And, and imagine this. Imagine if you go to your neighbors or you go into a coffee shop and you start a conversation with somebody and you said, listen, I really need to know this. I really want to know, what do I have to do to be brought back into right relationship with God? Like, what do I have to do to experience his forgiveness? Like, what do I have to do to become a Christian? Like, what do I have to do to to really walk with God? Like, I'm crazy enough that I actually kind of have those conversations with people. And and, uh, I've I've heard so many crazy answers. Like, um, when I asked one of my friends, like, what do I have to do to become a Christian? He was like, you know what? You probably need to stop listening to that rap music and turn your dial to, like, Caleb. Because that would help you get your life right, you know? And other people would say, you probably need to get a journal. Okay, you need to get a journal, start writing. Other people say, you need to start praying. You need to stop doing certain things. You need to start going to church. You need to meet with a pastor. You need to join a small group. You need to do all these things to become a Christian. What's interesting is like, they start talking to me all about all the things that we need to do that Christians are called to do, but they don't talk to me about what Jesus Christ has done for us. Like there's this missing component of what it looks like to become a Christian called Jesus. And I don't know if you're new to Christianity. All you guys are looking at me like I'm weird, but like Christianity is about Jesus. He's the hero of the story. To become a Christian, you walk with Jesus. You place your faith in Jesus. And so the question of what do I have to do to become um, a, a follower of Jesus or what do I have to do to become in right standing with God? What do I have to do to be in a good place with God? That question has been answered by lots of different worldviews and lots of different religions, and the way that they answer it is, is this. In every other major world religion, it's going to be faith in their God and something of you. So faith in God and your moral performance. Faith in God and your attendance to religious services. Faith in God and, and your purity. Faith in God plus your self-improvement. And I just want to say that's completely different than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no good news in the, the faith in something and your good works. Because I've been stuck in a, a, a kind of a season of religiosity like that before where it's really more about me and not what God has done for me. I mean, you're just, you're just always wondering, have I done enough? Religion, where it says it's faith plus something, it makes us really insecure because we're always wondering, have I done enough? It makes us really tired because we're always trying to hit a standard that we can't hit. The invitation of the faith plus something of us is no good news at all. Really what it is is the invitation to try harder and get better. Church, I want to distinguish the gospel from that message for us today. One of the cool things is that the gospel is actually different from that message. At the core of Christianity isn't an invitation to move from bad to better by trying. But, but, but the invitation of Christianity is would you come and move from death to life by placing your faith in Jesus. At the core of Christianity 
is a substitute named Jesus. And the reason that he's the hero is because he lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserve. And he made an, a, a way for us to be restored into right relationship with God by his doing. And so as Gavin would say, the core of Christianity isn't about us trying to do for God. It's about trusting in what God has done for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And as we look at this early church, I want us to see that. Now, um, I think one of the temptations for us is to nod our heads and say, yes, 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 yes. But we can make it about Jesus plus our performance in a million ways. Like we can pat ourselves on the back when we go a while without relapsing into something. Or we don't go a while without falling into sin. Or we go a while with what, for reading our Bible every day. And we just make it about us in some way. And we, we, we start to say, yes, it is your grace. And it is what you've done for us on the cross. But it's also... Um, that I watch Fox News three hours a day. It's also that I'm a Republican and not a Democrat. It's also that, you know, it's also something plus. And what the Bible is going to say is that it's just simply Jesus. It's just simply Jesus. One of the cool things that I, I want to highlight also is just I think that as Christians, one of the temptations we can have is for us to see people around us and want them to see issues like we see them. And so we start trying to correct people's views on political or social or even theological issues, but the primary foundational issue is the gospel. It's Jesus. What matters most is Jesus. What people do with Jesus, that matters the most. Um, Paul says the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it's the power of salvation for whoever believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. He's saying we've got to get our foundation right. You don't buy a broken house and start working on the window. You buy a broken house and you make sure the foundation is right. Instead of trying to convince people of their issues and trying to help them see things like we see them, we need to say, let's start where we need to start. Let's start with Jesus. Because nothing impacts eternity more significantly than where people land with Jesus. If they land on the gospel, it's going to work itself out in other issues. But what we really want for people is to land with Jesus and experience the good news of the gospel. That's the primary call of the church, is to exhort the gospel, preach the gospel, um, tell people about the gospel, and, and tell the story of what God has done on behalf of sinners like me and you. Amen? Amen. So the first thing I want to see is, um, let me just, before I jump in and show us, is um, before we jump into Acts 15, Acts 13 and 14, let me see, give it a little context of where we've been at. Um, last week, we looked at how the church in Antioch sent off Barnabas and Paul um, to be missionaries, to be church planners. And so these two guys leave the church. They go to new communities and new people groups. And guess what they do? They start telling people about Jesus. And these are people that had really never encountered God's grace before. And they're hearing about Christ. And they place their faith in Jesus. They come to Jesus. And then local churches are planted and formed. And then Paul and Barnabas, after being used by God in an awesome way to advance the gospel, they come back to Antioch. And um, what they find is is that the local church is, is kind of in a little bit of conflict because people are trying to say the gospel isn't just faith in Jesus. The gospel is faith in Jesus plus some stuff. And so I just want to look at how um, uh, Peter specifically begins to def uh, defend the gospel and how he begins to define the gospel. So look with me at Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Read this. It says, but some men came down from Judea, which is a region by around Jerusalem, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had uh, no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders uh, about this question. And so here's the issue at hand. The people in Jerusalem or Judea, were coming up to Antioch, and they were basically telling new believers. These are folks that have just recently started walking with God. This is a new church, a healthy church, a God-honoring church. But what they're saying is that your faith in Jesus is not enough. Like, yes, yes, your faith in Jesus counts, but it's only part of the equation. What you really need to do is you need to walk with Jesus, and you need to be circumcised. Which, by the way, any godly man is like, really? We're going to start there? Like, you're coming, that's your pitch? Like, that's the sales pitch. Like, come to Jesus and get circumcised. Like, I've heard better pitches, bro. Like, I've heard, like, get a donut and a cup of coffee. Like, can I get that pitch? Like, we're going with the straight circumcision pitch. Okay, so before we write, before we write them off and say, okay, dude, this seems like a little bit of nonsense, let me just talk to us about why this was such a big deal to this group of people. Um, previously, before Jesus came, 
um, there were really kind of two groups, right? There were the Jewish people. These were God's covenant people. If you remember in the Old Testament, God spoke to them and said, um, I will be your God, you will be my people, or you will be my people, and I will be your God. And basically, he chooses this nation of Israel, not because they're strong and awesome, but because they're weak. And so just by his grace, he says, you're going to be my people. And so there's the, Gentile, or there's the Jewish people, and one of the marks that you are one of God's people is that you were, you were circumcised. And God gave his people um, this mark to distinguish them from everybody else. He's saying, yes, you need to have a heart that is faithful, but one of the external markers that you're my people is you will be circumcised. And so when um, a Gentile wanted to come into the covenant people of God, there was required circumcision. Now, this party who's arguing for Jesus plus circumcision, they're forgetting again about Jesus that he fulfilled the Mosaic law, that he's the one who satisfied it. Listen, these guys are trying to say um, it's Jesus plus obeying the Old Testament law, the do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments, and plus some other stuff. And what Peter's going to argue is that Jesus is the only one that's ever been able to keep that law, and he didn't come to abolish it, but he upholded it perfectly. And so we as a people don't need to go get circumcised. What we need to do is just place our faith in what Christ has done. And so the accusation here for the local church is that it's Jesus plus something. And again, like I said, that's, that's a huge deal because we never want people to get confused about their salvation. And this is such a huge deal to them that they don't just kind of debate it locally. They say, let's go to Jerusalem where um, some of the big brothers of our faith are. This is where James, Jesus' brother, was. This is where John, one of the early disciples, was. And they said, let's get the boys together and start to hash this out. And so um, look with me at Acts 15, verses 6 through 8. And we're going to just look first at how Peter starts to defend the gospel. It says, The apostles and the elders were gathered together and considered this matter. And after, they had, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that, my mouth, uh, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them and by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Just as he did to us. Now, I want to talk about what Peter said to um, this kind of crowd that was trying to figure out this debate and, and this conflict. But one of the coolest things that, this, that kind of spoke to me this week is that Peter, in verse 7, it says that he stood up. He stood up. So in the middle of false teaching in the middle of these people trying to say that it's Jesus plus something else. And um, he stood up and said, no, it's not. He said, I'm going to defend truth here. He said, I'm not going to compromise here. You know what Peter had a choice to do? Peter could have said, you know what? Come on in. We'll listen to your views. We'll, you know what? We'll accept your views. We just want to keep unity and we want to keep peace and we want to avoid conflict. And that's not going to look good if we no. Listen, as Christians, yes, we're called to pursue peace and unity, and and we're called to be gentle but also speak truth. And what I see in Peter is Peter says, listen, when when people try to mar the gospel, when people try to slander the word of God and, and not stand on truth, he had a problem with that. Loving leaders do not remain silent when people try to compromise the word of God. He could have pursued comfort. He could have pursued popularity. He could have pursued um, just accepting whatever came his way. But he said, my loyalty is to this book. My loyalty is to the word of God. My loyalty is what to, to God, to what I've seen him do, to the calling on his life. He's saying, listen, um, my, I'm not going to compromise because some new guy came in with a blog and had four points and tried to confuse me. No, listen, the word of God has been around a couple thousand years, and it still speaks, and it's still true. And what I lo- love about Peter is, listen, we just need to recognize We live in a society where um, there are areas of our culture where um, people champion lies and try to suppress truth. And we live in a culture where good is called evil and evil is called good. And I I look at Peter and I say, God, would you help us to be a church that stands on your word, that stands up? Now, listen, we're not looking for a fight on social media, but we we do want to be a church that says, Jesus, we're not going to compromise. We're not going to say it's Jesus plus We're not going to say the Bible isn't true. We're not going to move off what you've spoken and what we know is true. So City Light, I look at Peter and I say, man, that's awesome. Can I just say as a pastor, I look at that and I say, God, would you help Gav and I and the pastors around here be these kind of men? that say, listen, um, we don't want there to be any confusion about what God's communicated in his word. And we are willing to stand in an unpopular place because we want to be true to this book. Amen? Amen. So one of the cool things that he does right after he stands up and he starts to communicate is the first thing that he does is say, listen, um, early church leaders, will you not remember what God has done already? 
Um, he basically says, do you not remember how God called me to go to the Gentiles, how I preached the gospel to the Gentiles, and then how the Gentiles actually came to know Christ? And he's not just talking in theory here. He's actually talking about a, a situation that really happened. If you guys remember in Acts chapter 10, um, God showed up to Peter, called Peter in a dream. He said, there's nothing unclean, if you guys remember this. And then Peter gets basically called in. And the first place that he goes is he goes to this guy named Cornelius' house. Now, Cornelius was this kind of powerful Gentile guy. He was not one of God's covenant people. He was outside the covenant people of God. And so he shows up. And he just starts preaching the gospel to this guy, Cornelius, and to his whole family. And the Bible records that basically his whole family comes to know Christ. And on the spot, they start worshiping Jesus and exalting Jesus. And the Spirit of God drops on these dudes, just like the Spirit of God dropped on the, the Jewish people in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. That same Holy Spirit drops on these Gentiles. And so he's saying, listen, this is not just theory to me. This is not just some theological debate that we need to have i've actually seen people respond to the gospel worship jesus get baptized on the spot and be filled with the holy spirit and that all happened way before we did any extra rituals or went out back to circumcise some cats you know like that that all happened so how are you going to explain if it's jesus plus something how are you going to explain what god just did in, the, in cornelius's family how are you going to explain what i just saw happen as i went out on a missionary journey and people responded to the gospel he's saying do you not remember what God has done? Let us not, let's not try to add to the gospel now. Let's not try to add to it. And so um, in this text, one of the cool things that we see is Peter's just warming up here. He's defending the gospel. He's saying we cannot be a people who try to add to it and make it about Jesus plus. God has worked in the Gentiles' life. We've seen him move. And next he's going to start to define what the gospel is just to make sure there's clarity about what this message is that is supposed to bring salvation to the nation. So would you look with me at Acts chapter 15 verses 9 through 11. Here's what he says. And he, God, made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. What I want to do here is, um, I don't have any cool alliterated outline, but what I want to just do is walk through these next three verses. And this week, as I spent time with God, there was just some stuff that popped off the pages. So I just want to share that with our church and encourage our church with three things that I felt like God spoke to us. The first little thing I want to communicate to us is that God is able to make what is dirty clean. God is able to make what is dirty clean. If you've got your programs, you can follow along there. I don't have them laid out, but you can write that down. Um, what I love about this is I just don't want our church to miss verse 9. There's this unbelievable gospel bomb that is just so rich with good news. And he just basically says the Gentiles came to God, and God was faithful to cleanse their hearts. And he did it by faith. And church, what I love about that is that if, if they needed to be cleansed, if they need to be cleaned from the inside out, that means they came to Christ dirty. They came to Christ as outsiders. They came to Christ with something broken. They came to Christ with dirty hands and dirty hearts. And Jesus is the one who by faith made them clean. I just want to remind our church, City Light, at the core of Christianity is not an invitation for us to come and clean up our life. If you're just trying to think, wow, look at all the progress I'm making, look at how I'm cleaning up my life, then you're missing the call of Christianity. The call of Christianity is saying, would you come to Jesus and let him clean you from the inside out? Because he is the only one that is able to do what you are not able to do for yourself. And I, I, whenever I preach the gospel, and I, I just tell people, like, listen, this is true. God actually cleanses the hearts and the minds of sinners. He actually brings dead things to life. He actually gives people new hearts that desire not the things of this world, but the things that glorify him. God is the one that will take what is dirty and make it clean. And if you're in this place and you feel like you've got secrets and you've got shamed and you looked at the website and you compromised and you did this thing this weekend and you're feeling like maybe a while ago you blew it and you're just trying to cover it all up, I want to let you know the invitation. Would you just not keep taking another shower trying to clean yourself up saying, I'll do better this week? But would we be a people who come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we've blown it. We are dirty, but would you make us clean? Because God in his word has promised Although we are stained, he said, I'll make you as white as snow. And he's not doing it by us covering it up or impressing other people. He's doing it us by saying, listen, we're dirty. We need you to make us clean by your perfect righteousness, not ours. Amen? Love the gospel because there's so much permission for people to come to him as we are 
and just say, God, I need you to do a work. Now, I love what he does also. He says that he's going to make us clean by faith, by faith. And so, again, he's not saying he's going to make you clean when you start taking four steps forward and you start seeing some progress, and then you're going to finally hit a standard, and you're going to be awesome, and it's going to be all good. What he says is you're going to be made clean when you place your faith in him and stop relying on you being a better version of yourself. He's saying, would you trust in what Christ has accomplished, his perfect righteousness, his perfect cleanliness, all of that is imputed to you or pressed onto you when you place your faith in him. He covers your sin with his perfect robes of righteousness. That's the gospel. And all it takes is faith in him. He says, listen, if you know a whole lot about this book, you've been a good church kid, you've been around the program for a little bit, you know the vocabulary, I don't care. If all you're doing is serving and smiling and all that's awesome, what you're doing is you're building a really impressive resume that counts for nothing. What he requires is faith. And God says, it is impossible to please God without faith. People, we've got to transfer our trust from us being awesome to God being awesome. That's point one. God is able to make what is dirty clean. Now, my second point I want to show us is um, this. And this is a really profound point. I'm just going to try to explain to you because... Uh, This is so deep, but the point is, um, we are not awesome, okay? And uh, yeah, we're not awesome. Now, I know that's a little bit offensive in our culture to say that we're not awesome because we live in a culture where we all think we're pretty awesome. Can we just acknowledge that? Like, I want to be the first to just confess that I bought a special selfie stick to capture all of this awesomeness, okay? So like, if anybody's guilty, I'll just put it right there for you, okay? If you're like, no, that's not me, that's you. Okay, yeah, it is me. You're not awesome either, though, okay? So let's just, we'll just have that right now. And, um, and so let me just begin to build this out. In the Bible, um, God consistently shows us that we are sheep dependent on the good shepherd, that we're the needy kids that come to the Father and say, we need your provision, we need your protection, we need your grace, we need your leading, we need you to speak. Um, the Bible consistently shows us, like, we come to the Father lacking, okay? We, like, we, we don't come with a resume. We come with a need, and um, we're sinners in need of his grace, And so um, when I look at this, I want to show us verse 10, how Peter Peter begins to um, build this point out for us. Look at how he starts to convict the Jewish people and say, listen, you're not any more awesome than the Gentiles. Let's look at how he builds this out. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? He's saying... um, What he's talking about with that yoke, that whole terminology, why are you putting the yoke on the new disciples? He's talking about the moral law. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about all the do's and the don'ts that are in the Old Testament. And this law is awesome, but one of the things that it does is it reveals in us sin. Like, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we don't say, man, we're awesome. You know, I didn't murder anybody. I haven't stolen anything. No, but Jesus comes and he just drops the script on us and Do you hate your brother? Are you angry? Are you lustful? Are you prideful? What the law does is it it convicts us and it shows us just how far we fall short of what God requires of us. It says nobody walks away from the law and looking at what God really requires and says, man, I am such a gift to everyone around me. Man, such a blessing. I'm so awesome. If people, people could just be more like me, the world would be a better place, you know? No, we walk away from the law and we say, holy smokes, and there's some stuff in me that is not of God. There's just stuff in me that is prone to worship me, that lives for me, that wants to exalt me. There's stuff in me that will take advantage of you so that I can get more from me. I mean, there's stuff in me that is not of God. And so he's saying, why would you place the burden on the Gentiles um, that we haven't even been able to keep these rules? We haven't been able to do it. We're the covenant people of God that God chose. That we've been walking with him. We know the book. We're the good teacher people. We grew up in the synagogue, and we can't even get the rules right. So why are we going to try to make the Gentiles do what we ourselves cannot do? What he does is he levels the playing field, and he says there's no varsity team and JV team. There's just broken sinners at the foot of the cross who need his grace. He's saying all of us have blown it. And the sooner that we realize that we're not as awesome as we'd like to think we are, the sooner we can start to transfer our trust from us and start to transfer our hope into Jesus Christ. So the first thing, the second thing that we see is that we're not that awesome. The third thing I just want to see is that God is awesome and able to save. Now, I just want to apologize for the junior high level language this weekend of awesomeness in the Bible. I, I was actually accepted to Harvard, but um, we couldn't afford it. And so we went to Wayne State. And so this is just kind of my vocabulary. Okay, this is just... This is just what you got, okay? You might be able to find somebody else on the internet. You know, you can try to hire somebody, but this is kind of what I bring to the table. And um, and so, but I also just look, I look at this text and I say, actually, no, really, God is awesome. 
Like he really is awesome. Like God is good and he's merciful and he's gracious and he's been good to forgive us and he is amazing. And when I read my Bible, like I see the character and the nature of God. Do you guys understand that God comes running after us even though we ran from him? Do we understand that God literally gave his life so that we could have eternal life? Like who does that? Like my son pops off and I want to physically take his life. You know what I mean? I don't want to give my life for him. I will take you out of this world. I mean, that's, that's how broken I am, but that's not the heart of our father. Like he's so good. And so let me um, start to show us how I land in this place that God is awesome. Verse 11 says this, read with me, chapter 15 says this, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. I love that just as they will. He's laying the playing field here. He's saying there's Jews and Gentiles, but you know what? All of us are justified by faith in Christ Jesus. There's no, you get in on this way and you get in this way. No, it's like everybody, it comes down to, have you believed in Jesus? What have you done with Jesus? Just as they are, he's saying, listen, the way into a relationship with God is faith in Christ. There's, that's it. And what I love about this is he highlights this word saved. And I know that's a church word. It's a religious word. But I, I circled it in my Bible this week because I, I just, I think, we do, I think we miss what this word really means. And I don't, I don't think we understand fully how beautiful this word is. So let me just drop this. Um, when the Bible says that we're saved, so one of the first things I naturally think about is, yes, we're saved from experiencing the wrath of God. Like, right? He just said we're guilty. We, we've all dropped it. We've all failed to, to fulfill the requirements of the law. So we're guilty people who've blown it. And so we're deserving of God's wrath. And so to be saved, you think, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to encounter his wrath. Instead, I'm going to encounter the inter- inheritance that he set before me. I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. But what saved means isn't that you just get to go to heaven someday. What saved means is you're not just saved from a place. You're saved to a person. His name is Jesus. You have access to him. That's what that means. City Light, when we say we're saved, I don't want us to miss this or minimize this. Like, when we're saved, that means we've been saved from a spiritual death into a spiritual life. When, that, when we say we've been saved, we've been saved from being a spiritual orphan, distant from our creator, and we've been saved into a redeemed family in which we have access to our father and our creator. When it says we've been saved, we've been saved to, from a life where the only purpose that we really live for is our glory, our kingdom, our namesake, our awesomeness. What a small vision to live with. You want to live with the biggest thing in your life is you? Sounds like no fun. He says you've been saved into a purpose bigger than yourself. Man, when we say we're saved, some of us look at this and we say, okay, that's cool, we're saved by grace and someday we'll get to experience Jesus and that's great. No, you've been saved. Not just so someday you can be with Jesus, but so you can walk with Jesus right now. Can you just imagine what life would be like had God not broken into your life and called you to himself? And so City Light, if we just minimize this, I want us never to be a people who just, who just kind of get over the fact that, we, that God has called us to himself and shown us grace, amen? Like, like, like if you just look at this with indifference, then you don't understand what you've been saved from and what you've been saved to. God has done a great work and he has spared no expense to ransom us back to himself. And yes, the word in this Bible is saved, but that should mean something to us personally because it's not just a theological truth that was true of the church 2,000 years ago. It's a theological truth that's true of you. You have been set free. You have been made new. God has spared you. God has called you to himself. God has forgiven you. God is walking with you. God has given you access to himself. When we see the word saved, we should be a people whose heart melts and our hearts are filled with affection because we look at what God has done on behalf of undeserving people, amen? One of the cool things that he says is, he drops the last word, he says, you're gonna be saved, and it's not because you're awesome, you're, he's, gonna, he's gonna save you in spite of you not being awesome, and one of the words that he says that is he describes that as, it's all by grace, okay? Now listen, here's what I know about me, is it's always about making the team, it's always about performing, it's always about growing the next thing, and I can become a Jesus plus my performance kind of guy, and I can start to try to earn the love and affection of Jesus, And what he does here is he reminds us that all of our right standing with God is a gift. It's all about his grace. It's not because we've earned it. It's not because we deserve it. It's not because we've done something special. It's not because we're better than the next guy. It's all because he's looked at us when we were at our worst and says, I want to give you my best. I want to give you salvation. I want to give you myself. And so when I look at this, man, can I just remind us that it's grace? It's grace that has set you free. 
And for those of you in the room, again, and you feel dirty and you feel messy and you feel broken and you've, ble- and you've blown it in a million ways and you've never felt right with God because you've always felt a sense of shame, I want to look at this verse and said, will you believe that Jesus Christ's grace is sufficient for you? That he can save you? Will you believe that God is enough, that it's not about your meriting and your earnings, it's about what he did 2,000 years ago and that still counts for you? Stop beating yourself up and living in shame. And for those of us who've been living like we are just so busy trying to perform and trying to show the world that we're awesome and trying to show the world that we are somebody and trying to show the world that we're better than we were a couple years ago and that we're making decisions and we're good people, would we just look at this and say it's all by grace? Like don't wear yourself out. Like don't, don't wear the heavy yoke that God has tried to set you free from. City Light, I want to close in this. As I look at this verse and I see what God's done, I just want to say, I think it should matter that we're people who have received grace. And I just want to encourage us not to just intellectually know about God's grace. I want us to experientially know his grace. I want you to just be like, where do you need to experience his grace in your life? Where do you need to remember that God has saved you from some stuff? But I also then want us to call our church to say, listen, knowing that God has done a work for us, that should actually impact our relationships with other people. Like we've received some crazy amount of grace. God has been so good to us. I want our church to be known for people who give more to others than they deserve. Like when somebody is weird and semi-awkward and walks up to you with a selfie stick, like just give them relationship, even though they don't deserve it. Amen? Just be nice. God has been so gracious to us. Who are we to withhold relationship to others? I look at this and I say, man, if God has really been this awesome to us, like it should change what we do with sin in our life. Like if God is really the God who spared no expense to ransom us back into relationship with him and he is so good to speak to us and adopt us and love us and forgive us, then I just, I don't know about you, but I don't want any more sin. I want more of the Father. I want more of the Son. I want more of the Holy Spirit. And so when I look at what God's done, it doesn't say, oh, that's neat, I'm forgiven, I'm gonna stay in sin. It says, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to be more in line with you, God, because I don't want anything in my life to separate me from you. I think our understanding of how God has been so gracious towards us should actually call us to move away from the things that hinder our walk with God. And as I look at this, what God has done, can I just say I want us to be a people who understand that Jesus has done a great work on our behalf. And so we worship him and we exalt him and we sing to him. Listen, the posture in heaven is not this. The posture in heaven is, Jesus, you are awesome. You have been so good. I can't believe you ransomed me. I can't believe you forgave me. I can't believe your grace was sufficient for me. I can't believe you broke in. Even when I was trying to run off and do dumb stuff, I can't believe you have been so faithful to me. And so when we sing, would we worship? It's not Jesus plus clapping your hands and dancing, but it's Jesus plus more than this. I don't know. That's legalist. Don't just edit that. Okay. Um, <laughs> But I want us to be a people who understand the grace of God and it actually wells itself up in a warm affection for Jesus. Amen? Church, let's never be a people who compromise the gospel, who move away from the gospel, who forget what God has done for us. Let's always be a church rooted in his, in his book, rooted in what he's done, not compromising on truth and saying, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for saving us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing us grace. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for fulfilling the law because we know we couldn't. So God, you've been good on our behalf. Let me pray. Lord, we love you, and um, we are so prone to drift from the gospel. So many of us in this room, we come to you tired, weary. We come to you, um, and maybe we haven't even given a thought to you. And God, I pray that this morning, God, your truth about what you've done for us, God, would it, would it marinate in our hearts? Would it stir something in our hearts? Would we not make it about us, but God, would we see you as the hero? Um, Jesus, we want to be a people who trust in what you've done. We want to be a people who worship and exalt you. We want to be a people who give grace to others. But God, right now, we want to experience your grace. We want to revel in what you've done. We want to never be a people who try to do more without remembering what you've done for us. So God, would you produce just a deep love for yourself in our church? We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.